Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. Today I am in the most remote wilderness-like location that I can get to within a reasonable drive of my home because I want to talk about isolation. I want to talk about what happens in small populations when they do nothing but inbreed with themselves over time. And the reason we're going to have this discussion is because of a brand new paper that came out. This is by Hu et al. Genomic Inference of a Severe Human Bottleneck During the Early to Middle Pleistocene Transition. Oh, this is very, very, very interesting. In fact, it's going to show us that the evolutionary model doesn't work. Mathematically, it's going to fall apart before our very eyes. Now, no doubt you have heard of the African bottleneck. This is when uh, Homo erectus got to an effective population size of maybe 10,000-ish individuals uh, for a very long time. For some reason, they never tell us how long that time was, but it's a small population in Africa for a considerable amount of time. And most Genetic diversity is lost, you have a lot of inbreeding, and that's the time where Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial E supposedly arose, and it's a time when Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus. Now, Homo neanderthalensis and the Denisovans, they're out in Eurasia, outside of this African thing. This is a Homo sapiens specific event. Now, of course, I think that Neanderthals are Homo sapiens and Denisovans are Homo sapiens, but that's another story for another day. We're just talking about the, the evolutionary model. We, we have this bottleneck where modern humans arise. But that's really only addressing the reason why Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve exist. That is, given a large enough population, or small enough population, I should say, over time, just by sheer dumb luck, one individual is going to become the male ancestor of everyone in the population. All the other Y chromosome lineages will be lost. And one woman will just be, at just sheer randomness, become the only mitochondrial ancestor. Now, this will happen in small populations given enough time. But this new study wasn't looking at Y chromosomes, wasn't looking at mitochondria, wasn't looking at X chromosomes. They were looking at what are called the autosomes, that is, the non-sex chromosomes, the rest of the genome. When they looked at the data from the Thousand Genomes Project and the Human Genome Diversity Project, they realized that uh, there's not a lot of diversity in the human genome. So they started cranking through some estimates using population models. Now, of course, you have to be careful population models, but using some evolutionary assumptions, they concluded that, wow, about a million years ago, the entire human population was reduced to a, a population with only 1,280 breeding individuals. That's a very interesting, very specific number, 1,280. But breeding individuals. When we talked about the African bottleneck, they talk about a, uh, an effective population size. And here we have breeding individuals. How come they don't just say population size? Usually in, in um, population genetics, the number N or the letter N indicates the population size. But they don't do that because in mathematics of population genetics, you can get a lot of different types of populations that will give you the same answer. So if you had a, a small population, it'll behave in one way if there's random mating. But if that population is broken up into smaller isolated populations, then the effective population size will be less. You don't have random mating, you have actually an effectively a smaller population because each little population behaves as a smaller population of the entire whole. So effective population size, number of breeding individuals, that's not the number of children or the number of old people, but they say 1,280. That's not a lot of people. That is a shockingly small number. And the mathematics that they're crunching through, they concluded that that population bottleneck would have lasted for about 100,000 years. Well, wait a minute. No, that's an extinction event. That would cause a species to go extinct. How on earth could humans survive that or pre-humans have survived that? Well, they don't talk about that. In the study, they got rid of all the protein coding genes, Whoosh, threw them out. And then they looked for things that are found in like one or two people. Okay, that letter there, now we're gonna ignore that. They're looking for very specific types of mutations, what they call high confidence ancestral alleles. And they wrote, to avoid the effects of positive selection, high frequency mutations were excluded. And the truncated, what they're calling a site frequency spectrum, which is a measurement they're doing, was used to infer population size history. Ooh, interesting. So they cut out all the protein coding genes, 
and they're going to assume now that the rest of the genome is non-functional. Ah, oh, the old junk DNA argument comes up again. And the old argument between the creationists and evolution is how much of the genome is functional? Well, I don't think 100% of it's functional, but I think it's a lot more functional than the evolutionists want it to be. So as we're getting to that argument, we realize that if more of it is functional than they think, then this entire population model is going to actually crumble on them. But they're looking at the non-protein coding sections of the autosomes only. They've got like 80, 826 million letters in, the, in their data set. That's a lot, but it's not nearly as large as the genome is, but they got 826. And I think that's 826 million letters. I don't think that's variable letters because I don't think the human genome is that variable. But either way, they're looking at a big slice of the, uh, the human genome. The problem is they're using thousand genomes data, which is low quality. But by getting rid of the things that are only found in one or two individuals, well, they get rid of all the sequencing errors, just like that, whoosh, gone. And they're looking at things they call important high confidence ancestral alleles. Okay, so you see that there's um, some, a finger in the pudding here, right? There's a, a finger on the scale. There's a, what do you say? There's some art to the science. I like that. That's better. An art to the science. There's human beings making decisions on which data they're going to include and not include. But when they do that, they conclude there's hardly any diversity in the human genome. And the only way to model that is to say that, wow, we, we nearly went extinct. Now, this happens to be a million years ago in their model, the, uh, the middle Pleistocene transition. This is a time when there's hardly any evidence in the evolutionary model of ancient human-like things. Not even quite human yet, but pre-human, half-ape, half-human, call it what you will, put a big scientific name on it if you want to. But there's almost no evidence in the fossil record itself at this time frame. So they say, oh, this is very convenient. We have hardly any fossils, and the human population only had about 1,000 individuals, 1,280 breeding individuals. Yikes. Uh, how did we survive that? Consider they're ignoring the mutation effect spectrum. They're just assuming that mutations happen at, I think, was 1.2 times 10 to the negative 8, or in other words, about one letter change out of every 100,000 letters each generation. That's uh, well, 100,000, 3 billion, that's 30, I guess that's 60 uh, mutations per genome per generation. That's not too low, but it is ignoring the creationist work, my work specifically, on patriarchal drive. Where I said, hey, if those guys in the Old Testament were living for hundreds of years, well, their little reproductive cells would have been dividing like crazy from the time of puberty until they died. So if one of those patriarchs had a child late in life, that child would have a massive number of mutations. So you cannot use a molecular clock to estimate the time going backwards to distant events. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're using a strict molecular clock. Okay, and there's some models we have relaxed molecular clocks and uh, molecular clocks where they look at A's and G's and C's and say, okay, these are more frequent than those, fine. But they're really doing a very simple, uh, let's use this 1.2 times 10 to the negative eight uh, site changes per generation. And they're using a 24 year generation time. Oh, wait a minute. That's not a biblical generation time. No, in fact, if, if you can live for hundreds of years, your generation time is not going to be 24 years on average. You're going to have children born much, much, much later than that. So they're not using a biblical model. We have to understand that when we look at the evolutionary conclusions. But the only conclusion they could draw was 1,280 for 100,000 years. No way. This gives up the game. This tells us that the evolutionary model is actually dead in the water. Because consider what happens if you took let's say a thousand people, put them on an island out in the ocean and they don't have any interaction. No one goes to the island, no one leaves the island. Or if they leave the island, never come back. And it's about a thousand people on that island, let's say for 100,000 years. What do you think is going to happen to that population? Yeah, they're going to go extinct. The amount of inbreeding, the amount of, of birth defects, the amount of mutations being fixed in the population, they're going to lose a lot of diversity because everyone's going to be related to everybody else. But the diversity that they carry is likely to be deleterious. Oh, now we get back to the old Mendel's accountant question and genetic entropy question. Now, look, a lot of the evolutionists, they, they really poo-poo Mendel's accountant without doing a very good job of understanding it. Fine, but listen, 
it doesn't even matter because they still have to acknowledge that most mutations are negative. Even if they say it's 50-50, in this population of a thousand people on that island, you're going to get a lot of bad mutations that are accumulating and they're beginning fixed. They're going to be rising in frequency. This population is going to be breeding itself out of existence. There's no way around that. So sure, I, I'm very happy that they ran these calculations. I'm very happy that they come up with these numbers. I don't believe them for a second. In fact, we have to be careful with population estimates like this. Richard Buggs, someone, an evolutionist I love to quote, he wrote this in his article, Science Moves Closer to Adam and Eve? Question mark. He wrote, Christians must be cautious about how they interact with studies exploring past human effective population sizes from genomes. Such methods are not able to either prove or disprove the hypothesis of Adam and Eve. We should also take into account the words of the British statistician George Box, who sometime around 1976, he said something like, um, all models are wrong, some are useful. Yeah, all models are wrong, but they can tell us things about our past. They can inform us of things. And what this model right here is informing us is that the evolutionary theory is wrong because you can't have a population of only 1,200 something individuals for 100,000 years. That is a disastrous thing from a mammalian species. Consider that humans, uh, we have a very uh, long generation time, unlike mice. We have very low reproductive rates. And in this population, if we're barely surviving like that, we're not growing, that means that most couples are only having two surviving children. Oh, that's not good. And it's not like females are producing 10, 12, 15, 20 children, and then like 18 of them get eliminated by natural selection, only two of them survive. No, in populations that are struggling, there's not a lot of excess births. They're luckily, lucky if they can get to replacement values. So how on earth did we survive? I don't know, but what this is doing is pointing us at the biblical picture. One, the human race across the planet is extremely similar from one person to the next. Okay, that kills racism right there. Two, Interestingly, we have hardly any genetic diversity, which means that we came from a very small population. Now, again, you could make an Adam and Eve Noah's flood model, and in that model, tried to estimate how long all this uh, population genetic stuff would happen like these people did. But if you just take it at face value, we know that we came from a very small population, and it's exactly what the Bible says. We have one mitochondrial ancestor, just like the Bible says. We have one Y chromosome ancestor, just like the Bible says. Now, this is not proof the Bible's true. No, Christian, understand that. But it is a massive problem and a headache for the other side. And I love that. Oh, one more point to make. The authors of this paper, Hu et al., they said that their 1,280 could be an overestimate. Whoa, less than that, then we're dead. So, that's their numbers. I'm happy to report them to you. Christian, be confident, be comfortable with the science. It's not saying that, that evolution is true. The science is not saying that creation is false. In fact, as we study more and more and more, the data are more and more pointing toward the biblical story. Well, I tried to keep that short. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to support biblical genetics, there are some links in the show notes below.